Hello, everybody, and we are live here on the uh, the Chess.com TV channel or Twitch.tv slash Chess, wherever you may be joining us. With me here for the first time, making her Chess TV debut, I'm pretty sure, is Women's Grandmaster and two-time U.S. Women's Champion, Jennifer Shahadi. Jen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's so fun to be a part of this. And we're going to be hosting the coverage tomorrow together as uh, Sergey Karyakin and Georg Meyer go at it. And uh, on that note, let's jump right into the preview here, Jen, as we have Karyakin and Meyer in front of us, reminding everybody that tomorrow's show will start at 10 a.m. Uh, and so your initial thoughts, obviously we have the world champion challenger uh, taken on somebody who qualified to be there. What are your first thoughts? As we're, we have a lot prepared to show the fans, but what are your first thoughts about this matchup? Well, I really think that it's like obvious that uh, we have a, a favorite in Karyakin against the qualifier, obviously. But um, I've been really impressed by Meyer looking at some of his games and just the way that um, he fights no matter what the position is and um, really regardless of the rating. So I think he's very inspiring to the fans. Yeah, he's super solid. And speaking of the ratings, that's a good cue to, to bring up our, our next point. Obviously, as you said, coming in on paper, it, it should be pretty clear to people who the favorite is. We have someone who rides between 2775 and almost 2800, you know, so, you know, an elite, elite player versus about 2650 Grandmaster. But from a style perspective, we know that these guys are, are both really, really solid, uh, both very technical and uh, really sound in their approach. And um, speaking of that, uh, that may be a little bit as to why the results between them is, is actually pretty even, Jen, right? We have, we have a draw. The only time they played in a classical tournament was in Dortmund, 56 moves. Uh, we have a win for Meyer from the World Blitz Championship just last year, and uh, Karyakin took him down in rapid. We're going to take a look at a couple of those games here today. That's right. And, you know, um, it really it really was interesting that there's so few games between these guys. So that's what excites me about today, because we're going to see um, so many kind of shifts, I think, in strategy and opening choice. Right. And we're, of course, uh, going to be previewing both the match that you and I will be covering tomorrow, as well as the match uh, taking place on Thursday between Anish Giri and Wesley So. But we're, we're going to get to previewing that in just a second because we don't want fans to have to wait too long for some chess. So let's let's start with this first one right in front of us, Jen. Uh, were you watching the day that this, I don't know if you were watching the day that this that this happened here, where we had this crazy qualifier. And do you do you recognize the position we're about to show the fans here? This is a great one. You know, one of the things I love about speed chess is, of course, that uh, we can always relate to the players and as they make blunders. Um, right. And this was a great one. Nothing more relatable than uh, dropping mate in two, if you ask me, or at least that's what I do. So <laughs> that's exactly what happened here. So after Bishop H3 check, for those of you who missed it, I uh, encourage you to check out the preview article because um, I believe the, the highlight of me and Amon Hamilton uh, was there, and we were just both absolutely blown away when Dimitri Andraken took on H3. So what is your, what, you, you've obviously played some, some big blitz games in your career, Jen. Um, I, I, believe, I believe one of the U.S. championships you won was in a playoff. Is that right? Was there, was there a tiebreak well, or a playoff? Actually, I lost, I, I lost a U.S. championship in a, in a rapid playoff. So, ah, okay. So I won two um, in won it in the classical portion, and then um, there was a third one that I I was runner up because I lost in the blitz part. So and who were you playing? That blitz that was against Anna Han actually the year that she won. Okay, okay, yeah. So uh, you obviously, as you said, it's relatable. It's easy for us to relate to top grandmasters in blitz because they do make blunders more than they do. Uh, when they have a lot of time on the clock, but have you ever ever made a blunder this big with so much on the line here, Dimitri Andraken? Literally, is the reason Georg Meyer is what we're talking about today because of well, this this a, blunder. I have a theory about that, Danny. Though, what do you okay. think? What is your theory? Do you think he missed Queen H five mate? Or I actually, when I was looking at this, okay, I was like, okay, my theory is that after Bishop H three, uh -huh. King H two, right to F one, I was like, well, maybe he just like. Um, hallucinated that he can't play queen d5. Maybe I, he thought I, this was like fourth mate. You know, we we were obviously in in live motion. If you see it, I was I was almost fell out of my seat, and and so Amon and I were speculating on the same thing, right? What did he miss that queen takes d5 would guard mate, and so he thought his hand was forced with king takes h3. Or I, I actually think your first 
theory is, is maybe more likely, which is that maybe he quickly saw that he could take the bishop and said, oh, well, I'm not mated here because the F pawn is pinned via the queen and just kind of quickly saw that there was no F5 checkmate and didn't see the other mate with the queen coming to H5. Now, not that that's necessarily a pattern that a super GM of Andraken's level would miss, but it was blitz, right? I mean, may maybe that's what he missed. That's a really interesting point indeed. But uh, one thing's for sure, it's fun to speculate about why blunders are made. And then we can kind of think um, about our own games and why we make blunders. You know, one of my favorite things about the chess tactics trainer um, on chess.com is that you can go back and see which patterns you miss the most. Right. So are you missing like smothered mates? Are you missing forks? I really love right. that. I think as I've, as I've gotten better at that, too, I'm always missing these endgame puzzles. So that's, uh, that's something I know I need to work on. I'm just not working on it yet. But OK, let's, let's move on to the next game here. Now, we, we wanted to highlight that, OK, these guys have played each other before, Karyakin and Meyer. We, we've shown how Jorg got here. Now we're looking at this one where Karyakin was black. And this was that win we were talking about, um, the, uh, the win from the, the World Rapid. Um, that being Karyakin's only win over Meyer. And, and maybe you can take us through here, Jen, the move he plays with 17 knight to d4 and sort of Karyakin's style here as he transitions into the endgame and really kind of puts on a, a technical show for everybody. Yeah, that's right. So after um, knight to d4, you know, this is just such a fantastic move. Um, after rook takes d7, um, bishop takes d4. Um, now, it's always a very important decision in chess when you have a capture to make. I, I know for right. the more experienced players here, it might be really obvious, but, you know, I've seen people perhaps take with the pawn or the rook here as well. Right. Um, and it's just very important to take care with the pawn because what's going to happen is black is going to control the only open file on the board, and that's very Nimzovician. That's right. what we need to do. And what's the reason for that? The reason is that this knight actually kind of serves as an outpost to stop the rook from coming to c2 and controlling the c file. So essentially, black is going to own the c file, and that is going to give him a huge advantage in the game. Another thing that black really, white really has to watch out for that can kind of come out of the blue is something like f5 knight d2 and e4 and suddenly this knight um will be start on shaky round so yeah it's, go ahead sorry yeah I, this is surprisingly good for black yeah no excellent point and i and i think i, I loved your your first moment uh first point too about making the right capture here and i think sometimes as you said advanced players with experience they just kind of know that this is the right capture in this moroxy bind to to open up the the direction of the board this way but really your point about the c file being under black's control that's just that's just huge and 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 awesome awesome and, and that's exactly what karyakin did here he dominates the c file and uh in a few moves here, we're going to see exactly why that C5 was so important. It's already obvious that white can't challenge black, given that the C1 square is taken, as Jen said, the knights here. But it's not totally obvious yet how black is going to really win the game, right? He's got the C file, but he doesn't have easy access. So we'll make a couple more moves, and then and then Jen's going to show us exactly what combination Karyakin launched really right here, right? When he when he showed that he had the foresight to know exactly where he needed to re-coordinate his pieces against Georg Meyer. And again, these guys are so similar, but here Karyakin got the better of it with a really very nice strategic strategic plan here. What Remember what black did here? Exactly. He played the move rook to c5. No. The thing about this position, we love our position, but you still got to win it. And um, that's what I really love about this game with Karyakin, where it's it's a rapid game, and yet he still finds these like creative plans. And so for those of you watching, um, give yourself a second to think, well, okay, you're attacking it once, so what? Well, right. he actually followed this up with um, putting more pressure on that pawn in a very um, unusual configuration. So after this trade on d5, now knight b1, knight c6, so we're pressuring it twice, that's good. And note also that this pawn can never come to b4 to help the pawn, which is really annoying. Um, but the, the kicker here is this beautiful idea, bishop to d8, a lovely retreating move. Um, those are ones that a lot of experienced players miss, right? Right. No, that 
that was a great point, and I, I like that you, you challenged the fans to think about how to do it. Because you're right, Rook C5 at first is kind of, okay, well, it obviously hits a pawn, right? But, okay, White's going to defend the pawn as soon as White moved this knight back. But this the plan that was launched where the knight and bishop would be finding new homes. And note, everybody, that Karyakin plays the super accurate bishop D8 and not bishop B4. Because even though bishop B4 also increases pressure, after the move knight to B3, black has, black has run out of cards to play. But after bishop d8, knight to b3 would have been met by rook, rook sliding over to b5, and white would have been lost. And so, um, really excellent point, Jen. I didn't even mean to use the cards to play, uh, but that's of course appropriate with you being being the professional poker player. For those of you who don't know, you should be following uh, women's grandmaster Jen Shahadi on Twitter. You're, what Poker doesn't have titles yet. Maybe poker should get titles. What do you think you would be as far as a title player in poker. If you, since you, I think you're one of the people who may be most qualified in the world to make that comparison. A lot of people try to say, oh, an international master is like this in another sport. But what do you think you would be as far as a poker player? Um, well, no, I'd be the worst. You all should play me. Oh, that's I'd right. That's right. That's... Me. Go and get me. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I set you up exactly, there. Well, actually, that's exactly the reason um, that uh, poker has certain advantages over chess, the fact that these, these you don't have ratings because right. um, everybody really thinks that they're one of the best. I mean, can you right. imagine if you could self-rate yourself in chess? Oh, yeah. No, um, I mean, every, would be like 2,500, right? Everybody and, on chess.com would be 2,800 for sure, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm like, I'm like 3,600 in poker. Right, very good. <laughs> or, or depending on the crowd, you maybe are 1,200 in poker if that's what yeah. you happen to think. <laughs> one or the so, other, exactly. So we we went through this game here, a great a great win by uh, Karyak, and, and as as the next few moves were played, we saw he won this pawn, and it's only a pawn, but it's a healthy one. Black had a two on one advantage and and went on to win. But before everyone thinks Jen and I are only painting this picture here, that uh, Meyer squeaked in with this amazing checkmate that we saw first uh, with a blunder by Andrekin, but he's really going to be outmatched by Karyak, and you know don't don't go anywhere because the next game we're going to show. Also, with the black pieces, apparently all these all these wins are for black today. Um, right. Is going to show that Jorg Meyer returned the favor when they played Blitz, and and he he actually took down the the challenger to the world championship title, starting with this plan he launched with a four to hit the queen, and he picked up this pawn on d five. And now, Jim, what is it about this position that so quickly uh, ran off the tracks for White? Why wasn't Karyakin able to hold this? At first glance, it almost seems equal, but but White has some weaknesses here. What what were those? Yeah, right. There's that weakness on d3, and again, there's these strong knights. This knight on d b4, um, in just such a beautiful position here. Not only um, serving as an aggressor, but also stopping White's counterplay with that right. a bishop really doing nothing at all. You don't really want to take it because we'd be always having a very pleasant choice. Um, taking with the pawn and opening the C file. Mm -hmm. So this, it's funny that you mentioned it's just uh, almost reminiscent of the other game in a certain weird way. Right. Karyakin put on the, the technical, you know, he uh, made Mother Russia proud with some technique, and, and then Meyer does the same here. Um, yeah, as you said, so the D3 pawn is weak, the A2 pawn is weak, and so material wise, we look at it, it's equal. Black's position isn't jumping at you as much better, but really, White just can't deal with all these threats. The knight, this knight might come in here. This knight might do some nasty things, and and that's kind of what happened. Meyer immediately gobbled up this pawn, and then brought the knight to c3. And as this position simplified right here, uh, he made he made this trade, taking on e4. And I think partly because he he sort of knew that he would be guaranteed an opportunity for a pass c pawn here. After takes, he uh, eventually is now going to be mobilizing both these pawns, and Meyer Meyer went on to win. Um, the the most instructive thing I think, or let's see, it's limited limited matchups with these two guys. But if, if we think about their their matchup against each other, Jen, we're we're talking about very different. Uh, so so Karyakin is the favorite over the board and the higher rated player, but Meyer also, you know, he probably plays as much on Chess.com as anybody north of of about twenty six fifty, right? He's got a ton of experience online. How much do you think that might tell the tale if, if he doesn't... I know he feels confident. I know Meyer actually chose to play Karyakin. He won the qualifier uh, challenge of all four qualifiers. He won the choice to, to play who he would want out of the bracket, and he chose to play Karyakin. So what, what do you think about that? Well, I think that he definitely has a, a good chance. I mean, this uh, this guy really can uh, can play, and he can make upsets, and this is speed chess. Anything can happen, right? Um, so I, I'm putting, obviously, 
uh, favorite as Karyakin, but I wouldn't I wouldn't give it even a two to one. Um, what, what about you? Or maybe two to one. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe maybe one and a half one even. I guess it's it'll be tough. I think that I look at this match, I look at the flow of this match being similar to, to where I put some of the underdogs before. If he can... If he can stay with uh, Meyer in the in the early stages, uh, sorry, if he can stay with Karyakin in the early stages, in the blitz, uh, the five minute portion, in the three minute portion, I, I I feel like he'll he'll have a chance like anybody does in Bullet when games are happening so fast, uh, and uh, and you know I, I don't know really what Sergey Karyakin's uh, Bullet bullet skills are. I know he's a great blitz player. He is the reigning world blitz champion for the record for those who forgot that famous picture of Magnus Carlsen being kind of upset on the podium there with Karyakin winning. Um, but I, I look at I look at Meyer's uh, fighting chance coming if he can keep the match close and get to the bullet. And, you know, I, I think Meyer is taking this super seriously. He's preparing super hard. And whether that means he, he gets an opening approach that, that works um, where uh, where he where he gets some wins or or something happens, I think just one or two wins in the, in the favor of the challenger would make a huge difference in a match like this. Yes, yeah, Stockholm snowballs. We've got a uh, Meyer who was uh, an MVP in the Pro Chess League, and that's right. I, I I think we'll see great things from tomorrow. I'm really interested in what openings we're going to see. Um, these first two games that we looked at from Rapid and Blitz were kind of like almost like non openings. You know, like a little ready, a little symmetrical English, a little bit right. off the beaten track. But I think tomorrow we're going to have a mix of that and some more standard type stuff as well. With yeah. some force thrown in. Given that given that we know Meyer is preparing and partly it's because I just, you know, uh, he we keep in touch pretty regularly so I know he's taking it he's taking it very seriously, but it makes me think I agree with you. I don't think he's preparing and then he's going to try to do something super weird and throw, I think he's going to try to reach something he's prepared in main lines and and take it as seriously as he would in, in over-the-board tournament. The last thing I'll say that I think might favor Meyer is one of the things that happens in these settings where you have three hours of straight blitz and bullet, no real time to rest, no real time to recover, is one one place where online chess can, can really play for your, if you have experience there can help, is the emotional swings are tough. When you've lost two or three games in a row, you have to pull yourself out of that rut, whereas in a normal tournament, I always say you would have a rest day, right? Or you would have mm -hmm. a few hours to go get a good meal with a friend and get some encouragement. You don't have the opportunity to do that. And, and I think that if if something goes off tracks for Karyakin, will he have the experience there that I think Meyer has a little bit more of in terms of playing playing hours and hours of online blitz chess? That that keeping control over your emotions if things don't go your way is just as important as things going your way. Absolutely, I totally agree. And you know, he Carl Moore, who is the first winner in the Speed Chess Championships round one. I mean, I love a quote that he once said about how if you do want to improve your ratings online chess, it's very important to go with the flow. And when you're on a roll and you're winning, keep playing. But if you are kind of tilted and you lose a tough game, stop playing. Your rating is right. going to go up if that's what you're interested in. Unfortunately, right. that's not going to be an option to tomorrow for anybody who um, starts getting whacked on. So I love that dynamic. Yep. And to remind everybody of the format, um, and uh, on the note of, of Jen saying that Hikaru Nakamura is the first winner, there you see the, the, the standings headed into this round. Hikaru Nakamura winning his match uh, by, by almost record margins. No one, um, I don't know if anyone will come close to Magnus Carlsen's margins over Tigran Petrosian in the first round last year. It was, it was almost 20 points. But, um, so a big margin there for Hikaru Nakamura. Great points that you brought up that he's, that he's said before. Um, and on that note, the format of this event is exactly that. We have we have 90 minutes of, of slower blitz. Five minute by the end will seem it'll seem uh, boring almost because we then we move on to three two blitz, and then finally uh, one one bullet chess with a chess 960 game thrown in in between that that counts for the score and is always kind of a fun a fun treat. So Jenna, I think I think we're kind of on the same page. We see Karyakin as the favorite, but we give Meyer. Uh, I, I'm going to be on record of saying if any challenger has a chance to upset one of the top four seeds, we've already seen one go uh, yeah, massively in the direction of the favorite in Hikaru Nakamura. I think it's Meyer over Karyakin, and that's no disrespect to the reigning world list champion. It's just the way I see their styles matching up, the way, how seriously I know Meyer is taking this match, and his experience playing on chess.com. 
Well, it's not Nakamura who's going to get upset. And, you know, that quote in um, the article on chess.com by Peter Dogger is also I just had me rolling about how Sergei Karyakin is going to um, borrow his second mouse. Right. <laughs> which, which is true, I think. I think it's actually true. Because <laughs> if you saw the pictures of Karyakin on social media, he didn't have a mouse. He's playing with a touchpad. Yeah, I mean, that's just, that's just outrageous. You know, playing blitz on a touchpad, I, I, I imagine that's like some version of hell for me. Yeah, I wish I had that that tweet and that video pulled up here for everybody, but unfortunately I didn't. But go ahead and follow uh, Sergey Karyakin on, on Twitter, or even if you're just following Chess.com on Twitter, then you've already seen us retweet it. But, Jen, I think it's time for us to say that, okay, we're going to have a blast tomorrow together. We're going to be focused on this match, but let's also give a, give a little justice here to the... Uh, to the 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 back to back marquee matchups that are happening this week, and the one that's coming up right after Karyakin and Meyer is the one that fans now see on their screen. Wesley So versus Anish Giri. This one has really got me excited. Um, I'm going to get your quick thoughts again. So obviously you prepared and have thought about this matchup. What what are you what are your quick thoughts on who the favorite is in this match and why? Well, I can't I can't bet against Wesley So, man. I mean. Yeah. You know, USA, go go Wesley. And also, not only that, it's just uh, he's uh, such a, a sweet guy. So I, I love how, despite being the number two player in the world, he never has a bad word to say about anybody. Um, you got to love this guy, pro chess league performance he put on. Um, I am going to give him the edge in this match. I'm also going to give Wesley the edge, and we've prepared some chess to kind of show why I think that, but you, you touched on a couple points there. I mean, he's he's so nice and so humble. I think the, 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 the fact that he's so humble keeps him hungry, and um, I think if anybody is excited about a chance to to perform well in this format, it's a new format for Wesley. He didn't compete in last year's Grandmaster Blitz Battle Championship. Um, I'm sure that he would love to get a chance to, uh, to take on Nakamura, or or Magnus Carlsen, who we will in the second round if he wins. Uh, the winner of this matchup, as you can see right here, between the eight nine seeds, will play Magnus Carlsen in the uh, in the second round. But okay, regardless of how we both see Wesley as a slight favorite, a slight favorite, these two guys have played each other a lot. Uh, they've both been over twenty eight hundred in their careers. Currently, Wesley uh, out out rating. Gary by almost 30 points, which is just such a massive margin at that level. Uh, but their results against each other are super close. Uh, total, we have two games in the favor of of Wesley So having won having won a couple games in blitz over over on each Gary. But in classical chess, uh, they've had 11 draws with a three and three record overall. That's that's a lot of draws. They've had two draws in rapid games with no decisive victories for either player, and they've had uh, four blitz games total, two draws, but two wins for Wesley. So, what do you what do you think of when you see those stats? Yeah, I mean, I think because we're going to be playing blitz, um, a lot of those draws are going to be thrown out the window. Um, right. I think we're going to see, I know that Anish uh, has publicly declared that he's refuting the Berlin. So right. we're going to see, you know, we might see a Berlin, but I think that's more of like an opening you're going to see. Um, my prediction is that's an opening you're going to see if somebody like loses a game and they want to just like chill for a minute. You might right. see that. But in general, I think we're going to see a lot of really aggressive dynamic chess because... The speed chess championships, you know, it's not just fun to watch. It's fun for the players. Right. So I think they're going to do a little bit of an experimentation. Of course they want to win, but they're going to try to go at each other's throats a lot more than you would see in, for instance, um, a classical tournament like the Grand Chess Tour. Right. Well, and uh, these two are both known as, as super solid, super tough players to beat. Um, Gary has had a little bit of a reputation of being a draw master, but, and, you know, he just did a, he just completed a dominant performance in, in uh, Reykjavik with 8.5 out of 10. So um, certainly we know he's capable of playing uh, for decisive victories in every game if he needs to. The funny thing about this matchup here, Jen, is it's a little bit of the opposite of what we just talked about with Karyakin and, and Meyer. Not many games to speak of. These two guys have been playing each other for a long time, both of them being sort of superstars at, at a very young age, right? Um, Peter Docker's preview match talks about that and really kind of lays out that they've been playing each other. I think they've, as, as he said, yeah, they first they first played in, in the B group at uh, Viking Z in 2009. Uh, and that's actually the uh, the first game that we pulled up here for the fans to see. It's it's a game that didn't go well for um, one one Wesley. So you want to take us through? Maybe we'll let the fans think about it, and then I'll let you tell the fans uh, the combination that Geary played here as black to win on the spot. Absolutely, yeah, guys, try to solve it. One, 
Wait, D I R I. Okay, I'm gonna have to give it to you now. <laughs> All right, there you go. After this move, uh, which was just played, knight e2, double question mark. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful move, rook f1. I mean, that move just makes you smile. You it's... can't take with the bishop because of the pin, and after king takes f1, there's queen f2, checkmate, protected by the knight on d1. And you know, this has to remind me of that uh, famous uh, maiden one that Kramnik blundered um, to uh, That's to right. Press, right? I never forget that. I, I get questions. I think non chess players ask that question more and more like, how could a world champion ever miss a maiden one, right? And I and of course it's of course it's shocking and of course he shouldn't. I always try to explain that as well. You know, when you're in bad positions, sometimes things happen, but also sometimes if it's a pattern you're not familiar with, you can blunder into things. But here here Geary had just completed okay, Wesley blundered with ninety two, but certainly his position was tough. Obviously he's under the gun here. Uh and, and then he just blunders with this move, ninety two allowing Rook F one check. But uh sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say that, it, again, just like with that bishop d8 that Karyakin made um, against Meyer, you see that these uh, maneuvers involving pieces where they're not usually at, like on the last right. rank here, that's right. the kind of thing that humans are really good at missing. Right. No, you make a great point. That was kind of... Uh... I was, that's what I was sort of touching on with the Kramnik thing, right? Yes, great players make mistakes, but they don't normally make those kind of mistakes unless there's something about the position that's a little bit weird or unfamiliar, right? We we uh, we talked about that bishop d8 maneuver by Karyakin and how uh, maybe the fact that the bishop went to d8 instead of b4 was what Meyer missed. And here the knight on d1 led to a weird mating combination that uh, Wesley just didn't see coming. But okay. Obviously, Wesley has since returned the favor. They've played many times. People saw the record we were quoting. We chose one game here uh, where Wesley had, had really put on, put, on a, put on a show of technique. Um, and in this position, Jen, White would like to take the pawn on d6 right away, but okay, he had to stop the counterplay by Geary of queen takes h3. But after king h2 and knight c5, take us through how Wesley just converted on this victory flawlessly. Yeah, you know, you gotta love Wesley so and the end game. That's that's what Wesley is all about. I mean, if you look at his pro chess league performance, what really struck me is the Magnus Carlsen like end game squeezes that he did, right? Right. So is this gonna be enough? That's a question that you ask, right? I mean, sure, this B pawn seems a lot stronger than the extra pawn that uh that Geary has, but is it gonna be enough to win? Let's take a look. Right. Yeah, great point, because it is three on three, at least it was until that. But yeah, the, the B pawn isn't that much if you consider it's only uh, it's only a pass pawn, but there are no material deficits for black currently. And, and also, Geary has his own pass pawn, which is why he played this move knight to c5. Exactly. He needs to get them running. You can't just like leave the knight here, keep this pawn, and you know hope to save the game, because this guy's coming really fast, right? Right. So that's the thing that happens in end games, especially uh, end games with, uh, with queens or with knights, that the speed of your pawns is so important. Right. It becomes less of a who, ha how many pawns can I keep and more of a who can get a queen first, right? And that's really instructive uh, by you to highlight because I think amateurs and lower rated players sometimes blow end games or they lose end games like this because of their, you know, it's very easy to get into sort of dogmatic material worship, right? You just don't want to lose a pawn and you forget that the most critical thing is going to be whether you can queen before your opponent or whether you can be the one who at least threatens to queen and then creates other problems in their position. Now you so say queen, what... what do you think the chances are that um, all four players um, in the next two matches have auto queen on? That is going to be fun. In fact, we should get some side bets going, right? We should have a, a parlay or some sort of other, some sort of side pool that says, will a game be lost due to a, an auto promotion issue, right? Somebody loses on time because they have auto queen on. Um, or they don't. I mean, but no. What are the chances? I don't know. I think I think for the more experienced guys, you don't think Meyer or Wesley So, having played a ton on our site even recently with the Pro Chess League, as you said, both of those guys were MVPs. I doubt it. Uh, you know, for for Anish Giri or Sergey Karyakin, who haven't played as much on our site, I, who knows, right? Yeah, it's online chess. These are the fun things that happen. Yeah, I usually have Auto Queen on, but then sometimes I give a chess lesson and I turn it off because I want to show like some amazing uh, under promotion. <laughs> and then I'm like, right. oh, oops. So now we see Gary kind of trying to get his pawn back in, but Wesley will continue to demonstrate really flawless technique here as he not only is, now that uh, it looks like Gary is doing a better job of defending the, this pawn, 
we see him starting to play on the other side of the board, this move G4. And um, that's going to be really critical as he actually starts to mount an attack on the Black King. Right. So really yeah, it was just kind of coming from nowhere. Um, now this move knight to f5. Um, problem is, like, obviously black would really like to exchange into a rook end game if he could keep something like three versus two. But the problem is, if you take on f5, um, the issue here is that not only are you going to be down one pawn, but this e4 pawn is also going to hang. Right. So that's basically the problem. Otherwise, he would love to keep um, to trade. I think. Pawn. I think real quickly, we should also highlight that knight f5 is well calculated because it also is is the perfect timing to to take advantage of black not being able to capture on b5. If if all those watching want to pause, or uh, I'll, I'll I just won't say it for the next few seconds because I know there's a bit of a lag, so you can see the combination here in terms of why this works. It works because not because we're taking here and then going to try to win a two on one for the next six hours, but we're just winning on the spot with a move like rook takes b5 followed by forking the king and rook. And I think that one of the things that good players or the best players in the world do really well, Jen, is you always notice that it's not just the the technical, you know, they, they sort of squeeze their opponent, uh, you know, with, with nice and, and accurate strategic play, but they're also, they don't miss their opportunity when, when those sort of things present themselves, right? When there's a tactical way to make an improved strategic idea work, they see it, and this, this whole idea with knight f5 works perfectly precisely because black can't just go take this pawn like he would want to. That's right. So, yeah, that's why they say knights are very tricky in speed chess, right? Right, Danny? Yeah, no, it's... Larry Christensen said he'd rather have a knight than a queen sometimes, although Larry was also... Larry also plays a lot of online chess simuls, so, you know, don't let that go to your head. But, are right, you also talking about bug house? I think he might have been talking about bug. Larry, Larry has... Larry's told me you never resign in bullet if you still have a knight. And in some cases, he if it's a closed middle game, he likes his knights versus queens. And, I, you know, Larry, but L Larry is also a professional material odds player. He's played so many great simuls on ICC, uh, the Internet Chess Club. He, he's famous for, for having theories on exactly how to play positions uh, when you're down material. So he's, uh, he's good at that. Anyway, sorry, continue. We digress. Oh, no worries. So, yeah, after G5 check... King d6, rook e7. So notice that Geary has finally, made, finally gathered some kind of material balance, but now it's not pawns that Wesley is going for. It's this guy as a kind of surprise mating net has cropped up into the position with not only threats of rook g7, but also more unusually, we're seeing that after rook h8, this beautiful move, king g4, also threatens knight to h4 checkmate, which is a really stunning one. I mean, that's not one, not a pattern that I'd really ever seen before. Right, and it's weird when you have a double attack of checkmates, right? You have the threat of rook g7, which is one of the reasons king g4 was good, because it took away that escape square, and knight h4. Yeah, that's not a mating that you'll see every day. And so after h5 check, the king comes back to f4, and now the pawn does the job of taking away his own king square, which makes threats of rook to g7 and knight h4 impossible to stop. So Geary, Geary resigned, as made is inevitable. That was right, that was really great. Yeah, we can just go there, right? And resume. And now these exact same threats resume with rook g7 and knight takes h4. I think you said it really well when you said that Wesley not only uh, ha obviously we know Wesley has improved a lot in the last year, right? We everyone has watched him uh, just skyrocket up the rating ladder, having uh, had the best year in chess, you know, really of anybody. I think in 2016, to be fair to say, and it really carried over into 2017. Uh, uh, one guy did defend their world championship title, so Magnus gets some credit for that. But but overall, Wesley is. And this is a game that, as you said, he shows this technical style that's very similar to Magnus Carlsen, always converting on these small advantages, and that's what he did here against Geary. Yeah, really really fine display by Wesley. So I do encourage you guys um, to uh, take a look at Wesley So's uh, games from the Pro Chess League where he played so flawlessly in endgames. But, hey, let's give Anish credit. I mean, he's just come back from Iceland, as you mentioned, where he – you know, brave this open tournament where a lot of times uh, the top players, you know, are at risk for nicking rating points. But, you know, he got it done in style. 
Yep. No, it's one of the things that we know Hikaru Nakamura does well of the top players in the world, partly because he was sort of raised on the American chess tournament, the Swiss circuit, or the Goichberg circuit, whatever you want to call it. But most of them, you're right, most of the top players don't always dabble in those in those events, so hats off to Geary. And, but I think one of the reasons you and I both see Wesley as the favorite, and though I expect the match to be very close, uh, comes up in our next game. The, the last game we've prepared here was one of Wesley's uh, better wins from the Pro Chess League, where he just... Again, just super accurate, always always willing to laugh in the face of danger. Uh, here he was black, and his opponent had just played this super tricky knight to d6 move. And I, I think I was actually covering this live. Um, and I remember being super confused about what, what black's best move would be here. But he just goes straight forward with obvious uh, moves and calculates well, and, and black, white's position is really just totally busted. Here he, here he plays the move bishop takes g2 and just gives up the f7 pawn, like I said. Not afraid of the queen being attacked, not afraid of this pin on the, or the potential pin coming on the diagonal. Played queen to d7, and after knight takes e8, just, just takes back the material. And we see that at the end of all these complicated lines, white is, uh, white is just losing pieces. Because after queen takes c4, the bishop comes back to d5 stopping any any crazy Venus fly traps that might happen and uh, Wesley would gather back the material. So I feel like his experience in online chess and and not not um, he's not going to be uncomfortable in any way on chess.com is another thing that gives Wesley a little bit of an edge. Yeah, I mean, but what would you put it at? Like, uh, are you thinking something like uh, 52%? I mean, I think the edge is going to be pretty thin. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I might be, I might be willing to go closer to like a fifty-eight, forty-two. I guess I, I feel like Wesley is, and 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 Geary is playing well. He, as you said, he just he just uh, had an excellent performance in the Reykjavik. I mean, he played solid chess in Moscow, which is where he just was. Everybody, in fact, he was flying home today from the FIDE Grand Prix. Uh, but, but I guess I just I see the carryover between how comfortable Wesley will be on Chess.com. Anish Geary is one of the few. Super GMs who actually didn't play in the Pro Chess League this year, although he was registered for the Chess Bras. He just never quite got in a match. Um, so I, I guess I see the online experience combined with him being just, I think, on a slightly... Um, is it fair to say he's just uh, playing a little bit better chess right now than I think, I think most people in the world are, and I guess that's why I see him as being a little bit more of a favorite. That's right. Um, I, I love how uh, Wesley So said that... Um, he didn't want to keep talking about Geary's strengths because he'd be on, he, he'd be talking all day and then um, he would lose his confidence for the match. You know, typical Wesley so quote, right? Right. I can't talk too much about how good I think my opponent is because maybe I'll convince myself of it. No, but seriously, I know he does feel that way and like he and he is just super humble and has a ton of respect for all of his peers. So, well, again, um, and uh, let's remind everybody that match is going to take place on. Yeah, May 25th. Well, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, the May 25th, right. So tomorrow we have the Meyer match um, um, against Karyakin, um, which you and I are going to be calling, which I'm so excited about. And then um, Aguirre Verso is on Thursday. So really big week of chess, huh? Yeah, it, uh, I don't think we've had a week bigger than this on chess.com, maybe besides the the final last year or, or, the, or the pro chess league finals. But Going to be a lot of fun. We will know soon who is moving on to play Magnus Carlsen in round two. And also if, if uh, Sergei Karyakin is uh, yet another seeded player to to uh, beat, beat away a challenger and, and their efforts. I think, um, it, it, I wonder if we'll know early in that match with Meyer and Karyakin. I feel like if Meyer is, is, is as well prepared as he'd like to be and, and he stays on the board in the first 90 minutes, you and I are going to know pretty early tomorrow, I think, whether it's going to be a close match. What do you think about the Chess 960? Do you think that that favors Karyakin or Meyer? Um, it's a great question. I, I mean, I guess I think that the, usually the, the white player in Chess 960 has, has an advantage um, that's even that's a little more sizable than in chess. Now we're very careful. We pick the positions uh, we, and we keep them secret so the players can't be prepared. Something a little different we're doing this year, but uh, we we try to get positions where the initial evaluation is very close, as close as it can be. But it's always I think the practical aspect that White is the first one to kind of dictate a plan, um, and because some of those chess nine sixty positions 
really do favor White a little bit, the first one to gain the initiative. Sometimes it comes down to whoever gets White twice. Somebody's going to get two Whites in the Chess 960, and somebody else is going to get a Black. Um, you know, that, that, might, that might decide it. But uh, from a, from a talent-wise pers perspective, these guys are both super talented. I mean, I don't know who, uh, who I would expect to do better at a first glance of a Chess 960 position. Have you ever played Chess 960 in a serious format like that? I did. I played it in the U.S. Open. They had a side event like maybe five years ago where we played a chess 916, man. It was really fun. But the problem is like we were playing a game 30 and it didn't feel like game 30. It felt like game 15. Right. Because, you know, you're, you're thinking from the very first move and you really kind of want to spend like even five minutes just kind of like sinking your head into it before you make a move. Right. Right. No, and I, and I think that's why the, the white pieces are, you know, white, white tends to take a little time. But often I think we've seen, I unfortunately didn't have that stat prepared. I, I wish I could back up what I'm about to say with a stat. But I, I, from having done all these matches, the commentary, I'm pretty sure white has a pretty massive plus score in the chess 960 portion. And, I, and again, we need to check on that in terms of how black has done at times. But I think that white has scored super well if, if we're counting the carryover from the Grandmaster Blitz battles and then into this year. So um, I don't know how I don't know how to get around that. I think sometimes it is a little bit of the luck of the draw. But it, you know, if white messes up and chooses a bad plan, certainly black has just as big of a chance to get the initiative, being that the positions are symmetrical. So um, yeah, but it's great. I mean, there's a, there's something for everybody in the speed chess championships. I mean, we're gonna get some mainstream openings, no doubt, later this week. But we're also going to get Chess 960, so it's it's wonderful that no matter what you're into, you're going to get it tomorrow. That's right. Well, Jen, this has been a lot of fun. I mean, we, we kind of rolled through our, uh, you know, what we wanted to show the people and get them hyped up. Uh, we're hoping that everybody here will join us, and certainly others will, uh, for the real thing. But Jen and I will be joining you, as we said. Uh, Jen and I will, will attempt to go live a little early with some pre-game uh, just kind of jitters and get the bugs out of the way and get people excited. But uh, make sure you're here, of course, at 10 a.m. because that is when the action will actually start. Uh, Jen, any final words for the fans before we send them off and, uh, and invite them to join us tomorrow? No, show up tomorrow, enjoy yourself, and you know, turn your, uh, your chest engines off and just try to, like, especially if you get into a crazy position, these guys, try to use that as your built-in tactics trainer. Um, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Absolutely. So I will see you tomorrow bright and early. Fans, we will see you as well. And uh, gonna going to be fun. Uh, we will, I'm, uh, I'm going to bring us out here with a... We'll we'll end the show here with our with our promo that we've that we've done and uh, let people get hyped up one more time by watching the commercial they've seen a few times. So, Jano, I will see you tomorrow and everybody else. Uh, take care. See you guys tomorrow. Bye. The 2017 Speed Chess Championship brings together 16 of the world's strongest, most superhuman chess players. Among them, you'll find none other than former Women's World Chess Champion, Grandmaster Ho Yi Fong, the reigning U.S. Chess Champion, Grandmaster Wesley So, World Chess Championship title challenger, Grandmaster Sergei Karyakin, the most feared man in bullet chess today, Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura, and of course, the Grandmaster Blitz Battle Championship winner, and reigning world chess champion, Magnus Carlsen. Don't miss a single moment of the action as these elite chess players battle it out for the better part of a $50,000 prize fund. The action kicks off on May 3rd when Hikaru Nakamura takes on the first qualified challenger, with Magnus Carlsen playing his first match on October 5th. All the action will be brought to you on chess.com slash TV, twitch.tv slash chess, or one of our numerous foreign language portals. Fans can find coverage in Russian, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and many more. Go to chess.com TV to see the full schedule of events for the 2017 Speed Chess Championship, fill out a bracket for a chance to win big prizes, and don't miss a single moment as we show you the world's